Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have our friend Cody Nelson, the optics manager of GoHunt.com. Cody, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Jay. It's a, uh, it's a great day in the, uh, the August 110 degree heat that we're having. Yeah. How about well, that? Well, it's, uh, it's a balmy uh, 84 here in Colorado, and I had a good hike this morning up uh, up above Aspen, Colorado, really, really steep country, and I got the heart uh, pounding for sure. Uh, so pretty much you're telling me you, right you, had to, yeah, you, you had to put a jacket on, did you? I actually wore a sweatshirt it. to the trailhead this morning. No, that's, that's it, really... It was uh, 49 degrees, 49 degrees in my house when I woke up this morning, so yeah, I had well, to wear a has, sweatshirt. It hasn't been 49 degrees in, 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 in Scottsdale here for uh, at least six months five, six months. So, um, no, everything's going good, Jay. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Um, got lots going on at Go Hunt. just incredibly busy. Um, God, thanks to all the customers. I mean, we are growing like leaps and bounds, by leaps and bounds. Um, I, I would tell everybody right now, go check out the sale that's going on, you know, for, for the holiday weekend. Um, it's, it's already started and it runs through, um, I believe they're running it through Monday night at midnight. <coughs> um, but it has been, it, it's just been feverish. Um, the customers have been great. The, uh, it's just, it's awesome. I, I, I couldn't, couldn't ask for a, a more, uh, fun place to, to, to work at them. I mean, it, it, it is unbelievable. August is typically a month that really kicks off. Um, where lots of activities going on with optic sales. Uh, how would you, we are, you know, 29th of August right now. How would you say that August has gone and what is the sentiment out there on the street with guys buying optics and, you know, oh, questions and uh, the flow coming in? You know, Jake, you know, obviously, you know, there used to be these periods and, you know, like people weren't doing stuff and everybody's so active and doing so much and, you know, working up through the, <clears throat> the early seasons, you know, our busy season for us really kind of, you know, starts kicking off in June. Um, but, uh, I mean, it, it kind of ramps up, and, and typically when you get to that August, September time, that is when the masses are are, are getting their gear and doing, the, you know, they're preparing. And uh, it's, um, you know, I, for us anyway, um, optic sales has been through the roof. Uh, tripod sales. Tripod sales are as good as I've ever seen them. Um, more and more people asking about tripods and, and glassing from tripods and, you know, mounting their binoculars and, and everything, you know, having to do with, with being more efficient on, on, on glass. It's, it's, uh, it's been great. That's, but that's yeah, great. We're, we're way up. Before we get into the question and answer portion of the podcast, we've got a lot of questions to go through. You mentioned tripods, and I just wanted to take a second and talk a little bit about the tripods that you guys offer at GoHunt.com at the gear shop. Um, I've been using slick tripods probably going on 15 years now. Yeah. Um, talk about slick and talk about some of the other manufacturers that you carry, and specifically, uh, you know, Slick has a uh, has a numbering system. If you would walk through that numbering system, sure. and uh, you know, kind of tell the listeners, you know, what six thirty five means, what seven thirty three means, you know, all of that different stuff. Um, yeah, uh, pr really simple. Uh, Slick is a company that's been around for quite a while. Um, they build really, you know, uh, solid, uh, you know, uh, quality products. Um, I, I am partial, and we carry. The, the carbon fiber series, the CF Pro series. Um, I, I really can't tell you uh, how elated we are to have been, you know, partnered up with them. Um, the, the tripods have just been flying off the shelves. Um, people are looking for, you know, they, they like carbon fiber because it's, it's, you know, a little bit lighter weight. It's uh, I, most of the carbon, I believe, on all of uh, of Slick is, is either six or eight layer carbon, so you're getting, you know, good rigidity out of the legs, and it's quality carbon uh, or carbon fiber. Um, the uh, the the the, uh, uh, the you know they they run everything from like a compact, you know, down to like um, 
uh, 14 inches all the way up to uh, you can get it to, to where you know it's tall enough. I think in the compact, uh, you know, like 24 inches tall, you know, and that gets to about 74 inches, and you know that compact one I was talking about goes to about 51 inches. So the basic numbers that you see um, with those is is uh, uh, the carbon fiber series, they have a 6 series, they have a 7 series, and, and an 8 series, and a 9 series. But the numbers that, you know, people probably pay the most attention to is the N number. So if you have a 635, that means it's got 5 leg extensions. If you have a 633, it means it's got 3 leg extensions. So generally speaking, if you have a high number at the end with 5 leg extensions, that means you're going to be a little bit more compact. Um, it, 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 you know, probably more for the backpackers or people really trying to save space, you know, uh, in the pack and weight. Um, so, like, you know, if you have a, a 733, that means that, that you have a tripod that's got three leg extensions, and which means it has the leg that comes off the, the trundle, and then it has one extension, two extensions. So it's got three brakes, or two brakes, but it's got three leg pieces. Um, so, but that tripod generally is going to be about, you know, um, close to, uh, I think you're at close to 20 inches on that. So it's a much longer tripod in your pack. But it's, you know, it's a super solid. If you're sitting down or in a chair, you don't have to use all the leg extensions. And so you have a really stable platform. So, um, you know, generally speaking, that, you know, that's how that whole system works. Um, but they do have three extension, four extension, and five extension legs. So um, if anybody's got questions about it, they can always call me. They can email me, um, you know, at optics at gohunt.com. Um, but it, it's, uh, it, you know, it's just, I would just tell people to, to understand what they do most of the time, whether they sit or stand or um, – I'm not a big uh, – I, I don't teach standing. I don't preach it. I, I – I do it sometimes, but very rarely will you ever see me standing and glassing. I just, I don't like to do it. And the whole reason is, is that the farther you go away from the ground, the more your, your optics will move uh, exponentially. Um, and, and I just, I like to sit or I like to sit in a chair and, and minimize, you know, my profile. I don't like to stand on the, on the skyline of a, of a hill and, and, alert everything, you know, because you don't know if there's a buck close to you or not, but I'll guarantee you if you're within three or, you know, four or 500 yards, that buck knows you're there before you do. So, um, well, I well just, and I think it's a lot of like shooting too. I mean, the closer you can be to the ground, typically the more sure. stable and the more consistent you can be shooting, yeah. I think as well, yeah. the closer you can be to the ground glassing and have a steady platform, uh, and have your eyes where they're not, you know, moving around, swaying, and what have you. I get a lot of questions, guys, talking about, you know, standing and glassing, and I try and discourage, discourage it as much as possible. Now, I think, you know, if you're running and gunning for mule deer or elk or larger animals um, or, you know, even possibly antelope, uh, I don't think it's as big of a deal. But when you get to some of the meticulous glassing of, you know, coos deer, sheep, um, you know, maybe trying to pinpoint and really isolate and look at stuff. Uh, certainly when you're trying to field, field sure. judge stuff, the lower you can get, you know, the more out of the wind you can get, um, the more, you know, just stable platform sitting on your butt is what I've found to be um, the most stable platform. You talk about those uh, tripods and you talk about, you know, the 633, that is a, you know, six series with a three-leg extension uh, or a 635, that's, you know, a six series with a five leg extension. Speaking about leg extensions, I want to talk to you a little bit about that real fast. I know we've talked about it before. Um, you know, you get the difference between a three leg extension and a five leg extension, um, you know, numbers of extension. In my opinion, the more extensions that you have, the weaker the component of the tripod becomes. Now, oh, I know absolutely. that the five is a very stable platform, but I'm going to argue that the three is even more stable, and even you hit the nail on the head, when you're sitting and glassing on a three-leg extension, a lot of times you're literally 
um, not even using the very lower extension at all, oh. and you yeah, may I'm... be two or three <laughs> inches into the upper yeah. extension. And so, I'm... you know, if, if you can stand it, you want to have as little ex legs extended as possible because it, if, if you extend those legs and have all five extensions out, you're going to have more vibration. Sure. Well, Jay, I, I, I've got tripods that if you look at the, the bottom leg extension, it, some of them, other than the pad on the bottom that touches the rocks, you could probably dismantle it, send it back to the factory, and they could use it new on another tripod because I try as much as possible never to use the bottom leg extension because it's a smaller diameter and it's weaker than the other leg extensions. So when you explain that to people, and, and, and I think that the, the, the premise for all of this is why do we use a tripod? Why do we do the things? It's eye strain. So the weaker your platform is or your foundation, the more your optics move, which cause more... Um, uh, it causes your eyes to get tired and refocus and focus and and just not be in, in, in that scanning mode where you're actually looking for deer. I think that's the thing that people miss about what we're talking about is, and, and, and maybe some people think that we're completely, you know, obsessive, compulsive, anal, retentive, and the whole deal and think that we're, like, these guys are crazy. But the difference is, is that... I mean, we find a lot of game that way, and I think it, you know, it, it, when you practice those things, you get really good at them. And, you know, I, I think that a lot of times you could spend eight hours looking through glass, and if a guy next to you is standing up, I mean, he might be scratching his eyeballs out by the end of the day. I don't know. But yeah, I, I, I think mean, there's some you know, people that say they have a bad back and, you know, they can't sit on the oh, ground. I would say, yeah, you know, get a glassing stool, get a chair, literally sit in a camp chair. I would rather see you sit in a comfortable camp chair uh, rather than, uh, you know, standing and glassing. But um, let's, we've got a bunch of questions to dive into here uh, today, sure. so let's go ahead and just jump into the questions here. Yeah, uh, perfect. And this actually goes right with the... Uh, tripod standing. It says, the first question comes from Jacob Dykes, AZ. What tripod will fit a 6'6 guy standing up? Um, I wow. can tell you that my 733 slick with the, um, the center post extension that's a little bit longer than the average, I'm 6'2", six 6'3", foot six foot on a good day, and I can easily stand, and I have more uh, uh, center post extension to go. So, I mean, that's one that you could probably start with. Cody, what do you think? Well, and, and the first thing to always remind people, you know, because uh, we get this question a lot, measure to the, measure to the eye, not the, not your, not the top of your head. So, I mean, and, and realistically, I mean, that could be, you know, three and a half inches. You know, it depends how big your forehead is, I guess, or how big your melon is. But um, always measure to the eye and not, not the other way around. Um, you know, basically, Jay, there's, there's, you got like, uh, if, if you do like a, a 733, you're getting a 66 inches. And then, you know, on top of that, you're going to throw a tripod head on there and, and you've got, um, let's just call it three and a half inches and, or, you know, depending on the head that you're using. And then on top of that, you're going to have either, a, you know, the, a bino adapter of some sort excuse me, or you're going to have a uh, spotting scope. So, you know, if, if you can think about that, that measurement, um, you know, that's really what you have to do. So um, I would tell that person um, that the 733s, uh, the 8, um, the, you know, the 833s, 834s, and even the 923, 924s, but those get a lot heavier and not so much like you want to pack them around anymore. So, I would tell that gentleman that's six six, if he wants to call me, um, and you know we can help, kind of get a tripod for him that works for him. And you know, I, I, the funny part of what I want to say is, let, let's not stand up, let's sit down, and you can use a lot more a lot more <laughs> tripods. But um, long story short, yeah, we we can get him rigged out 
Um, but I would tell them to look at the, the, the Manfrotto, like 055s or the, the Slick 733s, and then, you know, and then the components on top of that will get into that, you know, that, 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 that at least that 6, let's call it 63. You know, one more thing that I, it just dawned on me while you were talking that I want to mention is one of my biggest pet peeves is when I look over and someone's glassing one of my clients or something and they have, they're sitting down and instead of adjusting the legs, they adjust the center post and they've got four or five inches of their center post up and they're moving it up and down. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I would tell you as a general rule, I never ever try to raise my center post. And, you know, for you guys at home or, you know, whoever's listening right now, I mean, there's going to be, you know, uh, anybody, if you will take your tripod and you lock it down tight and you lock it down where, where, the, head, where the, the, the center post column, uh, that, that base or cap is all the way down on top of the trundle, and then you take the, 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 um, the center post on the bottom and kind of wiggle it, you can kind of see that, that a lot of these tripods have, there's just a little bit of play in there. Well, the higher you go, the more play that gets. And so I just always, as a general rule, I try to use the, the, the leg first. And if I have to use the, the you know, head and, and move it up, I'll do that. But I try, to ref I, I, I try to do everything I can to refrain from using the center post. So when people are standing, you're, you're going to have an issue with that. So, I, and Jay, if you don't mind, I, I got another pet peeve that, that I, I laugh at. I see in pictures all the time, and it, it, it just goes beyond, you know, uh, physics. If you take a tripod and you start, you know, like we were talking, how we were talking about, we always start with, like, the middle leg, you know, extension first. I see guys that extend the bottom leg all the way out and, and they don't even use the middle leg. Well, the diameter of, the, of the, 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 the lowest leg is always the smallest and always the weakest. So um, I see guys that will use their tripod and they'll use the little tiny you know, you know, feet you know, part of the legs and then they have the big tripod sitting on top of it. And to me, it, that just defies logic. It's, it, it's not sound. So I just would always tell people, use the fatter legs first. Okay, Cody, the next question I've got is from D-R-E-M underscore 25. It says, Swarovski or Vortex, question mark. Uh, you know, uh, well, kind of that's vague, kind of an open-ended um, question. I think whatever works for you and, you know, whatever your budget, you know, calls for. And I think you should know your job at hand and the glass that will work best for you that fits your, your budgetary, you know, confines. How about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, there's really no specific question there other than trying to – you're comparing yeah. apples to oranges. They both make binoculars. They both make rifle scopes and spotting scopes, but they're, you know, two yeah, and, completely and different companies. And absolutely. that's one of those things that, you know, what is your price point and well, then go it, from there. It, I think a better question it, would be Swarovski, Zeiss, Leica – and, you know, then the next question would be yeah, it, vortex, you know, loophole, you know, it, it's like saying, um, you know, Mercedes versus Toyota. Well, where do we even start? I mean, there's just tons well, of differences. It, 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 the, the thing is this, Jay, is that on both sides, look, if you take a, a set of 1250 ELs and mount them on a tripod, you're going to find game. You take, you take a 12 set of 1250 UHDs, mount them on a tripod, you're going to find game. And so, you know, you start doing the, the it's all the little intangible things that, that start to add up as to why something is, is and I, I hate to use the words better, and it, the bottom line is, is that it's just that when you start to do all the little small things, that adds up to that extra 10, 15% or whatever it is, that, that makes something better or easier to look through or less strenuous on your eyes. So, you know, I just, I'd simply say, you know, you, you got to go put your eyes behind them and, and make sure what works for you works. That, that, that's, that's what I would say. 
Next question is, for a backpack sheep hunt, what size binoculars and spotting scope would you take? Well, if he's talking about doll sheep, you know, he's saying backpack sheep hunt. So, I, you know, I don't know whether he's talking about desert big horn. Well, I think you're, you're horn. all over that. Um, but the way I'm interpreting that, when he says backpack sheep hunt, I'm assuming he's talking about a northern hunt. I assume he's talking about a, a, sure. a, a stone sheep or a doll sheep. And I would tell you that I think you're fine going with a pair of 10 by 42 binoculars that you can have around your neck and that you can mount on a tripod. And then the yep. spotting scope, you know, depending on if you're really – weight conscious and trying to save weight, uh, you know, you know, a lot of these 65 millimeter spotting scopes are going to be pretty ample for, um, you know, being able to field judge rams. Now, I know Brendan Burns with Kuyu, he carries a 95 uh, everywhere he goes. I know when I'm guiding desert bighorn sheep hunters in Arizona, uh, you know, I'm carrying a 95 all the time. Uh, so, you know, it, a lot of it depends on how physically able you are, uh, how much weight you're, you're willing to carry, what you're willing to sacrifice to carry the 95 over the 65. Uh, but in general, I think a 10 by 42 to sure. see uh, stone sheep and doll sheep is, is plenty, plenty uh, good well, enough. I mean, yeah, Jay, I think you get into a lot of different subjects there. And, and you know, a guy like Brendan, a guy like yourself that's guiding, the, the reason to carry the bigger glass and, and, the, and the, you know, the heavy hitters, it's real simple. Um, either you've got a client that wants to kill a sheep that's, you know, uh, of the oldest age class and the, and the biggest he can get, or if you've drawn a tag or you're buying a tag and you're wanting to kill uh, a sheep in the Northwest Territories or uh, Alaska or anywhere else, most of those have um, e either an age class or, you know, it's got to be a full or three-quarter ram, right? So, right. you know, you've you got to think about putting the glass, you know, that's going to allow you to do the job so you can make a good call. So, because my yeah, understanding sure. is it gets, it gets real expensive when you, when you shoot the wrong ram. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But and sheep is one of those things, too, that um, you can normally tell from a long ways away if it's a ram that you need to hike your butt off for a full day to get over and see what they are. Sure. I mean, normally... If they're of any size and age at all, you can get a pretty good sense looking through a 65 millimeter scope. Uh, next question is best scope for a 30 odd six, 400 yard max, looking for 750 or less. Um, man, I, I, you know, I'd probably put them in a like either the loophole three and a half to ten, um, you know, by 40. You could do a CDS or a non-CDS. Um, there's, you know, there's a couple different ways to go there, um, but you know, uh, you know, a, 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 a Vortex uh, Viper, you know, HD or HS, I'm sorry, with uh, um, you know, four to sixteen with a bullet drop compensator. Um, you know, you're, I think those would be excellent scopes for that. Um, you know, there's uh, it, just depending on on uh, the guys you know, really what he wants to do, um, you know, in the, in the system he's going to shoot under. Um, I, I think those two scopes would be excellent. Next question is uh, from hunt to eat underscore AZ, uh, all around glass power for a rifle hunter, mostly hunting mule deer and elk. Again, I think that 10 by 42 is just a classic binocular and kind of a do-all yep. binocular. You know, I if agree. you're not hunting coos deer, I think, you know, a 10 by 42 is, is kind of where you need to start and where you need to stop. I mean, that's that's a pretty good bino now. You know, you could jump up to the 12s or the 15s and, you know, get a little more power. But, you know, mule deer and elk are bigger animals. Uh, normally, you can just do great with a 10 by 42. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd add, I the only thing I'd add is, is you know, if a guy's – you know, I always tell people that if, if you're mounting off a tripod a lot, there's nothing wrong with a 10 by 50 either. Um, you know, just a little added, uh, you know, uh, exit people and a brighter piece of glass. So, uh, but yeah, 10, 10 by 42, 10 by 50 would work all day long. Here's Clyde Moonshine using the Sure ball head and VA5 fluid head. Best way to clean them after a hunt. 
You know, I've had this question a couple times. Um, the, uh, you know, I've I, I've really only had them out in the rain. Uh, well, I guess it's been twice now. Um, when I got back, I have a little mini air compressor out in the garage, and I, you know, I just I kind of hung it upside down or laid it upside down, if you will. Um, I blew it out and tried to get you know as much water out of anywhere that I could. Um, but other than that, you know, other than just trying to get dry what you can get dry, um, I, I think that's really about all you can do. Um, I think sometimes the if a guy will take the preventative measures and you know maybe put it in a in a thin you know type of uh, 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 cover, um, he can you know if it's in his pack and it's just getting drenched and so there's a lot of little things you can keep as much water off it as you can. But, you know, obviously sometimes you just can't avoid that. So um, I, I think when you get back, you, you do whatever you can to hang them, you know, put them in different angles and make sure that if there's, if you know they took on a lot of water, just, you know, try to blow everything out that you can. And, and, uh, and, and I always try to wipe them down. Same goes for dust or anything else. This is from M. Hayes 86. What are the main differences in prisms? BAK4 slash BK7, and which brands plus models use which ones? Well, let me answer the second half first. Um, there's a lot of companies that don't even list the exact prism that they use. But I'll, I'll very simply put it like this because you could spend a, I mean, you could spend a lot of time discussing prisms. Um, back four. Uh, prisms are generally uh, a higher grade or in better glass, and BK7 or Back7 are generally uh, in, in a lesser expensive piece of glass. Um, and, and, you know, there are, the, 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 it, it varies widely, and sometimes companies that have different lines that are good, better, best, they use, you know, they use one of the, they use the, the BK7s in their lower ends and they use the BK, or B, B8, box, <coughs> the back four uh, prisms in the, uh, uh, in the higher glass. Uh, and that's pretty much, but man, you can spend a lot of time looking at every single company in, in seeing what they use. Next question from Honey Badger twenty thirty eight. Have you looked through the Mavens yet? No, I haven't. Yeah, I, um, I haven't. Uh, as of late, you know, I've, I've looked through them. A, you know, I don't know, a half a dozen times. Um, great piece of glass. Um, like their model, the direct, you know, or, you know direct to consumer. I get it. Um, you know, I think there's a there's a lot of comparison to do with you know, uh, Mavens, Vortex razors, uh, UHDs. Um, Zeiss, I mean, I think there's a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Zeiss Conquests. Um, uh, 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 I, I think there's a lot of comparisons to do there, and I think you, you, you go with what works for your eyes. Birdie underscore G, what do you think of the Swirl EL range, thinking about buying? Um, you know, a couple things. Um, I, I don't know whether he's an archery guy or a, um, I'll just start with the, the only negative thing that I can really tell you about uh, the EL range. Um, the, the, the EL range will not range below, you know, the 33-yard mark. Um, if you shoot a lightning-fast bow, that may or may not be a big deal to you. Um, so I would tell you that, you know, I know a ton of rifle hunters that that is their favorite. Um, I use it. Uh, it's, I, I think the glass is, is, is excellent. Um, the range finding capabilities are excellent. Um, it's, it's never let me down. Um, it's, I, I mount it on the tripod. Uh, the one other thing that people ask about all the time is, you know, how bad do the humps bother you on the bottom? They don't. Um, I, you know, I pretty much don't even notice them anymore. Um, and, and generally speaking, you know, when they're in a chest pack, I, I mean, I don't even know that they're there. So, um, but yeah, overall, I think it's a great piece of glass, uh, line of sight, um, distance and angle compensated distance. Um, and I've gotten ranges out to 
Jeez, I think my farthest in that piece of glass was like 2,048 yards. So, yeah, yeah I, I really sure. The only it. thing I would add, to is the button for a bow hunter. It's on the wrong side. It's yeah, on absolutely. the left side. So if you're a right-handed yep. bow hunter and you hold your bow in your left hand, yep. you have to lift. I, agree. I have the Swarovski Yale range. You have to pull them up to your eye, and then you have to reach over with your right index finger over the top, and it's a little cumbersome. Um, I will tell you, I've been testing out the new Zeiss uh, Victory RF. I do like the fact that the button can be moved to either side. It comes standard on the right side. Um, I've been asking for that, that for a long time, Jay. Yeah. So that's a really Swarovski, good thing. You know, Swarovski, obviously you get the Swarovski quality uh, in the glass and the light transmission, and it's, it's an awesome piece of glass. Uh, the only sure. thing I hear is that bow hunters tend to lean uh, towards the Leica or t t towards the, um, you know, Zeiss because of the button being on that side. The okay, next question is um, cowboy roll. When hunting elk in September, which direction should I be glassing into? Uh, so my answer to that would be in the mornings, get up where you can kind of see open parks because the elk are going to be congregated in yep. open areas, typically meadows, and then they're going to be working their way into the trees. And then as the morning progresses, I'm going to be immediately glassing total shade pockets. I'm going to be elk are notorious for afternoon seeking the thickest, darkest timber that they can. Uh, in Arizona, where you have big stands of pinion juniper, a lot of times you can literally predict where the elk are going to go bed, and that is, you know, you can look at Google Earth and find the thickest pinion juniper uh, country and, you know, stands within the pinion juniper country, and that's where all the elk are going to be bedded. Uh, in you know, places like Utah and Colorado, they're going to use the roll of the hill uh, they're going to use, you know, blue spruce, aspen. They're going to use as much shade and utilize as much shade to stay cool as possible. So, and, you know, I think that goes for deer hunters as well, um, you know, especially in these early seasons, but even on into the October, November, December seasons, uh, yep. especially if it's warm at all, most all four-legged animals are going to bed up in the shade and, yep. you know, when I go coos deer hunting in Mexico, I pretty much can predict where the bucks and where the deer are going to be bedded. When you look at a hill, you look at the afternoon, you go for your afternoon glass, just find the places that are shaded when you first show up. And yep. those historically yep. are going to be the places where those animals so, are going to be. I, I, I was going to mention just real simply, like, for the most part, you know, guys, if you put yourself in a position where you can watch the elk go into their bedding area, you know, I would just tell people, like, don't, don't, don't push the bedding area. Let, leave the bedding area alone and, and use that information for where you need to be the next morning or that afternoon. Right? Make sense? Yeah. So if, you, if you're watching them go into a bedding area, get to that middle point where maybe you're going to cut them off when they're, when they're, you know, when they're coming out of the bed in the area. But I don't know. I'm just not a big fan of going in there and, and, and exploiting the bedding area, you know, to, to disrupt it. Because I think once you disrupt it, you're, you're going to cause yourself a lot of work to figure it out again. Next question from Max Henderson, 11. Go-to glass for turkey, small, mid-size to fit in turkey vest, mid to low price range. Um, Max, I use just a Swarovski EL 10 by 42s. I know that's in the upper price range. Um, Cody, what are your thoughts yeah, on some small I, I, mid-size? You know, I, uh, I think a guy should take a look at the, like the, um, I just brought on the, like the Leupold um, Alpines, the BK2s. Um, what, what a, what, I mean, what an excellent little piece of glass. They're, they're not overly big, and, you know, they're, they're, you know, it's not like they got giant padding all over them, and they, they fit excellent in a, uh, it, I mean, you can put it, like, underneath your, if you're using a vest or whatnot, but uh, they'll, they'll fit easily in a, in a chest harness, and um, either that or, like, uh, the new Diamondback HDs from Vortex, that would be an excellent piece of glass, um, and you're going to be, you know, in that, you know, both those pieces of glass are going to be in that $250 range. 
Um, but, you know, if you're just using them for turkey and, and you want to save some money, I think those would be excellent for that. Uh, next question, Brad Stinson, 21, will deer slash elk follow the sun throughout the day or stay on one slope? We kind of talked about that. They already yep. know where the shade is uh, when they, when they, you know, head for their beds after their morning, uh, after their, eat, uh, you know, night out uh, chasing, you know, cows and and does around, they already know exactly where they're going to go bed, uh, and historically they're going to be on those north, northeast facing, most shaded slopes, um, and so you can literally scout and look for the most shade and just predict that you're going to find more animals in the shade in the afternoon. I would recommend uh, don't ever put the sun at your back in an afternoon glass. You always want to be looking into the sun. Yes, you can see things shining when the sun's at your back in the evening, but you're, you're looking at the wrong side of the hill. If you're looking into the sun, that means you're looking into the shade. It's yep. harder to do, but that's where the animals are going to be. So definitely uh, from probably an hour and a half after sun up, you want to be looking into the shade with the sun in your face. And as it moves, uh, obviously it sets in the west. Uh, you always pretty much want to be glassing west in the afternoons and looking, you know, even if it's looking at, at specific trees, uh, you know, out in antelope-type country and you're hunting elk, look for specific trees and look specifically on the shaded side of the trees. And a lot yep. of times you'll just see a buck or a bull bedded right there in the shade of a tree, and throughout the day, they'll just kind of hop around that tree. You know, as soon as the sun beats on them, they get up, they move over, now they're in the shade, and then the, the, the sun keeps moving, they get up, they move again, now they're in the shade. And so that's why sometimes crossing, you know, at noon to 2 to 3, 4 o'clock, you'll catch them stand up and move. Uh, that's why glassing during the day can be super effective as well. Absolutely. Could not agree more, Jay. Uh, next question is, will there ever be a straight DTX? And then it says, is the twin spotter's best overall glass for straight long-range glassing? Cody? Well, um, the, the BTX, uh, I don't, I mean, as of right now, and I, you know, I just met with the, the Swarovski team, and um, I, I just don't think that they're, I don't think there's any plans to do a straight BTX right now. I, 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 for the for all the guys that want that straight BTX, I get it. I understand it. I, I like the idea. Um, I, I, I just don't ever think it's going to happen. Um, so I, for a simple answer, uh, I no, I don't. Not right now. Um. As far as the uh, the twin spotters, Jay, you have a lot more experience with the spot the twin spotters than I do. But I mean, how can you go wrong if you've got a good solid? Um, I, I think the most important piece of, of the twin spotters is you have to have a bracket that is solid and will not allow the glass to move. Once you get that handled and you get them set for your eyes. Um, I mean, Jay, you can back me up here, but, I mean, yeah, that's going to be an excellent piece of glass and look, but you got to do some work to, to get it there. And once you get it there, I think it's, it, it's arguably as good as any of the others. So uh, I think that's pretty, pretty simple. Yeah, and the question comes from Chad Sorensen. Uh, I, I've been using the Twin Spotters now for a couple of years. Uh, they are, I would say, not as comfortable as looking through like a BTX or looking through a COA or looking through um, a doctor optic, um, sure. just something about them. The comfort level might not be quite as good, uh, but they do perform very, very well. Uh, the one thing I use the 25 by 50 uh, wide angle lens and the 65 millimeter uh, objective. Uh, the one thing I wish Swarovski had was uh, I guess for lack of a better term, I wish there was clicks. So at, at 30 power, at 35 power, at 40 power, at oh, 45 yeah. sure, power, sure. there would be an actual click or a set spot where 
the biggest problem with my twin spotters is I can glass at 25 power and everything's great. I can glass at 50 power and everything's great. But when you start m moving in the magnification range in the middle, like you have to be exactly on 30 power on the left eye and 30 power on the right eye. If your magnification is off a little bit, I'm telling you, you start pulling your eyes out and looking at you going, am I, you know, am I losing my vision? Because your yeah. eyes are looking through two different magnif magnification powers. So if they would make a little stop point or a little click or something, that would make those even better. Um, and, but, you know, yeah. they're, they're a lot lighter than the Koas. They're a lot lighter than the Doctors. Well, that, that was, uh, so, yeah, see, they are a, an amazing that, tool. What I was going to bring back to this is that, it, I mean, look, um, you know, Greg Trogue and I were just talking about the 40 by 80, you know, super wide angles with the ED glass. I mean, look, they're, they're all awesome glass. And, and you've got to do what's right for you. But th there's two things that I want to point out to this guy that, that I'm not telling you you have to or you, that you're, you know, making a mistake if you don't. But with the BTX, you're talking about at the heaviest version is like six pounds. And, and you, you get to use a, a medium weight tripod with it, you know, with a medium weight head. And you, you, the, the literally, I mean, holy cow, are you a lot lighter than any of the others. But with that being said, if you, if you took a BTX out and you told yourself, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to diligently learn to use this. And when I say learn, I mean basically take it out and put your eyes in your, in your hands and tripod and, and, and get coordinated with it. Because I used to hate angled anything, but then I had to learn to use the Koa's and, you know, I made myself use a spotting scope, an angled spotting scope for a year. And pretty soon you realize that it really is just hand-eye coordination. It's like learning to shoot, you know, traditional, you know, uh, uh, you know tackle for archery. You, you know, you got to know, you know, it's that, it's that instinct of like, I'm looking at a hill and boom, I'm going to move my optics and I'm right there and I'm looking at what I was looking at. So I just think if you give it time, you know, some people can't get over that, and, and that's okay. But um, I find the BTX to be, quite frankly, I find it really comfortable to look through for a long period of time. Um, I keep my tripod shorter. Um, it, it just, it, it just, I guess it just because I just diligently try to, you know, hang in there and, 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 and get coordinated with it is what I try to do. Does that, that I mean, I don't do, does that, from, oh, okay. That's good. Landum Boomsma. Landum <laughs> Boomsma. That's the best I can tell you. Uh, I love millimeter these names, and by power. The way. Millimeter and power for an all-around spotting scope, and 15 powers or 18 powers for coos and antelope. Well, my, well, you know, all-around spotting scope is. If I had to choose one all -around spotting scope. scope well, that's, that's my point. If I had to choose a millimeter of spotting scope, if I just had to choose one, I'm going with the light gathering every time. I'm going with the 80 mil or 85 or 95. If I just had to choose one, okay, let I'm me, going let 85 me or bigger. that for a second. To the people out there listening, um, you know, you've got 65 millimeter or just say 60 millimeter up to say 95 millimeter. So the bigger... The objective, so a 95 millimeter is going to be a bigger objective and it's going to gather more light because it has a bigger hole, if that makes sense. And Cody, correct me if I get no, it, it, no, you're, you're, you go yeah, with a 65 good. objective, that's 65 millimeters, so you've got a smaller opening or smaller hole, if you will. So when, he, when Cody's talking about light gathering, uh, anything that you go with a bigger objective, and it goes the same thing with binoculars. If you have a 10 by 42, the, the last number 42, that's 42 millimeter. So that means the, the diameter, the, the, you know, the opening is 42 millimeters as opposed to 15 by 56 millimeter. That second number is objective. 
that is going to gather more. 56 is going to gather more light than a 42, just to make that clear. Sure. Um, and when he's talking about best all around, I mean, I mean that's so up to someone's opinion. But I mean, I would think just a great all around would be, you know, an 80 to 85 millimeter objective, plenty of light gathering capability. Certainly, the 95 is is you know, it's what I use, but it's also a lot heavier because why? It's bigger. It's, yep, exactly. Um, but, you, you know, okay, you, then, I mean, think of it this way. When you switch from an 85 to a 65, you, you've just lost 20% of your light gathering ability. If the power is being equal, if you're using it like on 20 power, you've just you've lost 20% of your, your, your light gathering. Right. I mean, that, that, that's the cleanest way to find and, and quite frankly, I... You know, I think if a guy took a 10 by 42 or a 10 by 50 and an 80 millimeter spotting scope or 85 millimeter spotting scope, I don't think there's anything he can't do. The next question is of his is and 15 powers or 18 powers for coos and antelope. Well, I think both 15 and 18 both are going to be great. Uh, you know, 15 power. Uh, Zeiss makes 15. Swarovski makes 15. Leica makes 15. Uh, none of those three big companies make 18s, uh, but, you know, the new Vortex uh, 18. The UHDs. 18, UHD. Yeah. Um, you know, they're very good. But then you compare, you know, the, the 18 power UHDs compared to the 15 power Swarovskis. Yes, they have three more power, and yes, they are great for the price point that you get them at but I still would probably go with the 15 power Swarovskis for twos and antelope, my personal opinion. Yeah, I mean, Jay, I compared them uh, to, to uh, you know, really for a morning a uh, couple, you know, two Fridays ago, really sat down behind the glass with them and really kind of compared them side by side, looked at some some uh, pieces of dirt that were, you know, anywhere from 600 to, you know, probably 1,500 yards. Um Hey, look, I'm not going to tell you that the UHDs are, I mean, I was really impressed with them. But when I really started to study and really started to, you know, the, I'm just going to flat out tell you they are not brighter than Swaros. But did I see, an, I mean, it, did I, would, would I equally find game in them? Sure, I would. But, again, I, I, I almost always lean myself or lend myself to the wider field of view with that 15 power. Um, there are going to be some people that, that instead of buying a spotting scope, and if they really don't like looking through a spotting scope, it, you will be perfectly happy and use those 18s, and you will really enjoy looking through them. I, I, I got to, you know, Jay, I don't even know if you and I have talked about that, but I was really, really impressed with them, and I think that there's a lot of guys that, that, that specifically for that price point are going to absolutely love, uh, uh, you know, purchasing them for their, their long-range glassing, you know, 15 use. Uh, I think they're welcome and going to do a great job in future country for sure. Um, yeah, I, I just, I think you got to, you know, I, I always take the field of view personally, but... Um, you know, I understand when a guy wants to, to up the power a little bit. So Next I hope that answers that guy's question. I am underscore Visa. Do you take a spotting scope with you on hunts, or is a good pair of binos good enough? Well, if I'm answering personally, yes, I take a spotting scope on every single, every place I ever go, I take a spotting scope. Um, yeah, very, now, very I, rarely would you ever catch me without a spotting scope. One thing I do want to point out, if you're just out there trying to shoot any buck or you've got an antlerless hunt or, you know, you don't care anything about antlers and you're just trying to, if it's a buck, you're going to shoot it, or if it's a bull, you're going to shoot it, then maybe I can see not having a spotting scope and just pop up your binos. Yep, it's a buck. Okay, I'm going to shoot it. Um, if you're trying to classify, categorize, break down, you know, trophy hunt, uh, you know, trying shooting something that you, you know, bigger than what you've already shot or looking for kickers or trying to, you know, age a sheep, then I would highly recommend a spotting scope. There's, 
you know, very rarely a time, maybe a turkey hunt. Obviously, I don't carry a spotting scope on a turkey hunt, but for big game hunting, if you're the type of guy that wants to be able to see what you're shooting at, I would definitely recommend right. taking right. a spotting scope. Next question comes from P underscore Scott 19, Zeiss Conquest versus Razor UHD, quality of glass. So just on a quality of glass standpoint, what do you say, Cody? Um, I think they're really, really close. I think it's, uh, like I said, when we, when we were comparing stuff and, and looking at stuff, um, the, the, the Zeiss Conquest I've used many, many times in the field and enjoyed that immensely. Um, I, you know, I can flat out tell you that, you know, and, and, and it's tough when you start, you know, you do have that extra three power, so, you know, is it the extra three power you like or, um, again, but I, I would tell you that uh, I, I think it's a really, really close um, you know, gain there. I, I, it, it, would, it would be a hard decision for me to choose between the two. Cody, I want to take a quick second here and thank the sponsors of the podcast. Obviously, GoHunt.com. Sure. Right now I'm talking to you, Cody Nelson. You are the optics authority, the glassing guru. You're the optics manager at GoHunt.com. They are a sponsor of this podcast. You are the optics manager at the gear shop. I want to recommend anyone that's looking to buy optics, looking to buy tripods, you have glassing questions, to give Cody a call directly for any info and sales at 702-847-8747. That's extension 2. You can email him directly at optics at gohunt.com. I also want to remind you guys for the month of August here, uh, use the promo code JSCOTT19 to enter the $1,000 Go Hunt Gear Shop August giveaway. So if you spend $12, you get 12 entries. If you spend $3,500, you get $3,500 worth of entries. We've already announced the winners for the June and the July winners, and we talked to both of those guys, and they were super stoked. And it was cool to hear the excitement in their voice that they had won the $1,000 uh, promo giveaway. And I just want to thank Go Hunt for their sponsorship of this podcast. I also want to remind you guys that Go Hunt, the insider, the best Western, Western hunting resource out there, uh, is doing a free trial right now. So you can become an insider member for free for 30 days. You can check out all the strategy articles. You can look at all the draws, all the harvest statistics. You can break down the units, the states, the animals that you like to hunt. All you got to do is go to Go Hunt dot com forward slash j scott follow the prompts you're going to that's going to sign you up for the 30-day free trial i want to thank kuyu that's k-u-i-u kuyu ultralight hunting uh kuyu is the gear that i wear the backpack the clothing all of the different gear that i wear on my hunts uh, that you see on my instagram page you can go to k-u-i-u dot com to order gear there uh, I want to thank them for their sponsorship. Also, Phonescope.com. Been using Phonescope for years. Use the JSCOT19 promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount on all orders. Uh, also, OnXMaps.com. Onyx Maps. I've been using it now for years, hunting and fishing. Uh, I love the fact that you can differentiate between public and private. It actually shows the property boundary line so you know where you stand. Uh, it also has a breadcrumb feature that, you know, you can you basically don't need a GPS anymore. This, this phone app works as your GPS. Uh, you can walk in in the dark with the breadcrumb on and walk out and just follow the breadcrumb out. Uh, I like the fact that you can switch back and forth between aerial and topo, hybrid mode. It's just a great, great tool. Go to onyxmaps.com. Use the JSCOT19 promo code. You're going to get a 20% discount. Okay, Cody, next question. In a group of hunters, who brings the weight of a spotting scope, question mark? Which one, question mark, and why? Well, first of all, this is a question of when I go with a group of hunters, we all take spotting scopes. Uh, it's not a situation yeah. where one guy <laughs> takes a spotting scope. When I go glassing with Dar, or if I go glassing with Cody, we all have our spotting scopes in our pack because the worst thing that I want to deal with is I'm over glassing and someone, you know, you know, a half mile away or 40 yards away says, oh, I got something, I got something, bring the spotting scope over here. I want to I know that the guy's already looked at it in the spotting scope and says, yeah, you know, Jay, it's a big yeah. three buck. He's, you know, 
this exactly. is exactly how wide he is, how long his points are, and, you know, pull out of your glass, Jay, to come over and look at what I'm looking at. Okay, but how many times have you been glassing with someone and they say, I got, I got a buck, I got a buck, and then you got to jump over, take what you've been working on, and then jump over and look over and go, dude, it's just a two-point. Then you go back and you just get out of your rhythm. Um, another thing Not I'll it. add to that, guys, when you're glassing with, with someone, one of the things I hate about glassing, and, and Dark Holborn, he absolutely refuses to glass sitting next to someone. He, he hates it. It drives him crazy, and he can't concentrate. Um, I get the fact that, you know, you want to go with your buddies, but, I mean, if you want to really kill big animals and find lots of animals, you can't be distracted all the time. You have to be in your zone. You have to be focused on what you're doing. So the idea of only bringing one spotting scope, the only time that that would play in my mind uh, is like on my doll sheep hunt in Alaska. We, Dar and I, we, he was not hunting. He was just there helping me. Uh, we chose to just bring one spotting scope uh, for that hunt that we were going to share. Uh, but on most, and now it's a weight-conscious hunt, but on most hunts, uh, definitely, I think everybody should have a spotting scope. Uh, you ask which one. I like the Swarovski uh, 65 and 95 millimeter spotting scope. Um, the the uh, STX, I like the straight spotting scope. Uh, speaking about straight and angled, I think target acquisition on a straight, I'm much, I'm much better using a straight. And yep. I don't think you have to move. When you glass something up with your binos, you pop your binos off the tripod and you set the straight on. You don't have to adjust your sitting position at all. You can just stay sitting exactly where you're at and you look right through the spotting scope and the animal, you have your binos and your spotting scope lined up beforehand so that whatever you're looking at, the clip on the bottom, the, the, adapt, the adapter piece, it, it's set up perfectly so you pop your binos off and set the spotting scope. You don't have to search for it. It's right in the center of your view. Cody? Well, yeah, I mean, I just kind of go back to the whole, like, I don't mind sitting next to people, but, like, I, you know, if you want to talk about the biggest time suck on the planet, sit next to somebody or a couple of other people, and they start arguing about where the buck is, and you need to go to that tree, this bush, that dead agave, whatever it is. And I, and I would just tell you that sometimes if a, if a guy has his own gear, and he has that ability to where he can verify himself, all you're doing is helping your other guys be more efficient. I mean, it, I guess it just depends on what you're doing and, you know, how relaxed the situation is. But, you know, I've been out with, you know, a lot of different people. And, you know, if you're teaching somebody and, you're, and, and there's no hunt going on or something, that's one thing. But, like, sometimes when the, you know, when it's time to get it on and, and you're trying to concentrate, um, you know, I, I get what Dar's doing. And, and, you know, if it's that big or it's that something that you need to, you know, uh, uh, verify, I get it. But not to mention the fact of when you do that and you pull a guy out of his deal, the, you know, the ground starts to look like a yard sale. And then, you know, your gear's strapped, you know, between 40 yards, and then you've got to go pack up and actually go try to shoot something. Then you've got to spend all this time putting everything back together. I just, I don't know, I just, I, 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 you know, I, I, would, I would tell guys just to, you know, concentrate on what you're looking at and really try to catch it moving. Yeah, you know, and the other thing I might add to that with this, you know, in that same light is once you've become – a, a, an accomplished glasser and an accomplished hunter and you, you know, harvested a few animals and, you know, you have a group of guys that you hunt with, don't be the guy that is the guy that is calling, uh, you know, a little buck, a big buck. Don't be the guy that says you have a big bull and it turns out it's a dink. Be the guy that's credible that you've <laughs> already established that this is a giant and, you know, you never want to be labeled. The worst thing, the, the, the thing that I've worked so hard with any of the guys that I hunt with is credibility. If, if Dark Holborn says, Jay, I got a giant, get over here, I drop everything I'm doing, I pick up everything, and I go sit right next to him. 
But he never says, hey, Jay, I got a giant, unless he has a giant. So yeah, call exactly. it what it is. It's okay if you say, I don't know what it is, but it looks like a big buck. Well, That's okay. <laughs> but don't be the guy that gets caught with your pants down and, and every time gets called out because you said you saw a giant and you sit there for the next six hours and it stands up and it's a dink. Don't be that well, guy. But, but why, you know what, Jay, on the line of that, don't be this guy either. I know things can get competitive between people, but don't be that guy that glasses up a doe and says he's got a doe and then literally gets the whole team of people or whether he's with his buddy or not, gets everybody else concentrated on that, and then he's off to find another deer. And I'm going to tell you right there, boys and girls, that if you've got a guy doing that, and then at the end of the day he says, well, I glassed up more deer than you, I mean – you know, we've all had that fun, but, you know, I, I, I mean, there's people that do that, and you're like, geez. So if you got a yeah, doe, that's words, great. They, well, they want to find a deer, and they want to tell you about the deer they found and, and, and then take you off of what you're looking at. You come over and go, okay, I, okay, yeah, I got the deer. And then you're like, well, where? And he's already looking, you know, three ridges over, and he's got, I got another deer. Don't be that guy. Don't do yeah, not be it, that guy. Yeah, and, and yeah, <laughs> so there's, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. This is from TDF underscore outdoors. Does max height really matter on a tripod? My huh? argument would be not really. If you're, you know, standing, yeah. everyone needs to understand, in my opinion, standing and glassing is a mistake. There's very few times that I'm going to stand and glass. I'm telling you right now, and I will argue with anybody that sends me a direct message, so go ahead and send it. If you stand, you are missing stuff, period, end of story, end of discussion. You are missing stuff. We've already talked about this, but it's like I get this over and over and over. Stop standing. Sit down in a chair. Sit down on your butt on a glassing pad. You will find more, period, over over a period of consistency of time, you will find more if you sit down. Yeah, I, I Jay, I'm, I am right there with you. And if you get an overflow of DMs, you can pass them right on to me. Okay. Now, Austin again, remember, r- r- but but remember, there are guys that because of their back, or I, I get it. I, I'm not saying never. But I, here's the one thing I would tell you: if you're the guy that has to stand up. Try to get off the, the, the skyline. Just try to get off the skyline. Get into a place where you've got a tree that, that you can back up to and, and, and not, I'm just telling you, it, I, I, I've watched too many people from another hillside that they got deer around them and under them and they know that that guy's standing there glassing and all they do, the deer just beds down. I, I, I've seen it too many times. Got and they're up there moving around and unpacking stuff. Austin. And All right, let's move on. Austin <laughs> underscore Rollins 1. How heavy of a tripod is a good balance of weight and stability for your average hunt? I think somewhere in the 3 to 4 pound range is optimum. I think any time you go below 3 pounds, you start getting into the uh, you, you start to compromise the stability and i so i just tell you that you know if you can get in that 3 pound range i that's a that's a good solid tripod if you go to the 4 pound range you, you know you're not too heavy but yet you know and, and and in that 3 to 4 pound range by the way you're talking about varied heights and sizes and and uh, i i i I just think the three to four pound range is, is really good. If you get sub two, I, I, I would rather, I, I, I'm already telling you, I've got a bottle of, uh, of, Izine, of Izine in one hand, and I've got like, I'm scratching my eyeballs out with the other. The more my glass moves, the, the, the worse I'm going to be at the end of the day. Next question, Brandon.Cassidy, best hunting rifle scope for ranges out to 800 yards. Um, well, that's a little bit subjective because it maybe depends on the caliber he has. 
Um, you know, I, I think a scope right now, there's a couple scopes that I really, really like. One of them is, is the VH, uh, I'm sorry, the VX5 um, by 3.5 to 15 uh, 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 by 44 CDS. Um, I really like the V4 4 to 16 from Zeiss. Um, I, I really like the 3.5 to 18 by 44 from Swarovski to Z5. Um, so I think there's a lot of scopes that will do what that, what that gentleman is asking. And I think that those three um, give you certainly a, a, a varied, um, you, know, uh, you know, and, and again, like the Vortex, you know, uh, there's a couple different razors. <coughs> there's a couple different... Um, uh, there's a couple different uh, 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 razors. There's a couple different vipers um, that'll that'll keep you in that range too. But yeah, R Stokesy eight. How important is parallax adjustment on a hunting scope 500 yards and under? Well, I mean, here's the fact: every scope is generally parallax free out to about 150 yards. Okay. So any time you go beyond 150 yards, parallax obviously becomes something because we wouldn't do it if it, I mean, it, it, we wouldn't make parallax, you know, adjustable scopes if it wasn't an issue. So I would tell you that if you're telling me that I could have a scope with or without parallax adjustment, I'm going to take with because I just want to make sure that my head is behind the shoulder square or behind the scope square, and that my eye is in the in the same spot it always is, and that I am not getting any distor any distortion or or anything in, in that in that uh, reticle. So, quite frankly, I think anytime you start shooting quote unquote the longer distances, <clears throat> I think it is something that you need to pay attention to and, and make sure that, that you're good to go. Uh, D Hicklin twelve. What's a good head for the Razor eighty spotter? I'm going to say the Suray VA five. Yep, I'm I'm a big fan of the Suray VA five. Can't can't stress it enough. I think it's a uh, I think it's one of the best do all do everything uh, 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 ultra compact fluid heads on the market. Period. One hundred sixty five bucks. If 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 guys really want to look at a good combination on our website right now. Um, it, it'll be loaded up here, like literally within hours. Um, they need to look at the the Sure um, VA5 and Sure combination uh, spotting scope or uh, spotting scope tripod. Uh, it's 189.90, uh, and I think it's a wonderful piece of gear. Um, I've had more compliments on it than I could possibly get, and, and the tripod's going to rate you know right at that three pound mark. And it's awesome. I, I would absolutely tell you to go look at it. Shane underscore O2, do you suggest scope covers or caps for October, December hunts? I assume he's talking about rifle scope covers and caps. Yeah, I, 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 and Jay, I, um, I normally, I've always used um, like the Uncle Mike's bikini cover. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just I think that you know they fit over there super tight, um, and I'll tell you right now a lot of people go oh, well you can't look through your scope if you need to. And I'm like I, I don't ever, and I mean ever, look at my scope unless I'm in intending to fire the gun. Period. Yeah. So if you're using your optic as uh, you know, and I've heard guys say you know they 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 put their spotting scope up or their rifle up and they turn it up to 24 power and they use it. No offense, not in my world. I will yeah. not do that. I, I, I just I frown upon that heavily. I've had people point their scopes at me, or it rifles at me. It it unnerves me, and I would just ask that for safety reasons, you know, please don't do that. But, yes, um, bikini covers are good. I think any of the above that work for you and that makes sense, and I, I don't like things that are loose on the, on the, on the, on the fittings, um, I do like some of the neoprene covers that, you know, that, that strap over both. So I, I think you go with whatever works for you. You want to keep the lenses clean. You want to keep your glass yeah. clean. So covering them in any way you can is great. 
uh, whether it be from dust, debris, leaves, water, whatever it may be, yes, cover yep. them. And he says for October, December hunts, I'd say for all hunts. Next yeah, question for is yep. Vance, Houston, monopod, bino, and walking sticks. Uh, no. Well, you know, I, I would uh, say there is a situation <laughs> if you're going to be, you know, walking around and it's going to be, you know, on the move. But as a general rule of thumb, like if you come on a cooster hunt with me, I mean, don't even show up. Do not show up with a monopod and walking sticks and be like, I have my tripod. Don't, don't even come. Don't even waste your time coming because you're not coming. I, no, absolutely not. Now, yeah, on an animal hunt, um, yes, maybe, you know, maybe there is a case. But, you know, I, and Vance, I'm sorry, it just struck, strikes a nerve with me because, no, it's, that is not a substitute. A bog pod is not a substitute for a tripod. Well, I will tell you that in my experience, and while I'm not as... How did you get me so as, fired up today? Well, I, I don't know. I, you're a little... <laughs> you're, I don't want to say moody, but you're a little, a little, a little testy. testy. Gee. Um, I will tell you that, um, look, I get it that a guy wants to use a, a Manfrotto walking style. I, get, I totally understand it. And I would just tell you that if I'm glassing, and I've done this with a guy that's using a monopod, I spend more time telling that guy is where the deer is again because he has no way of stabilizing his optics to where that when you're staring at something, you can't hold it, you can't, like, step away from it. So every time he moves, he's like, oh, I've got to find it again. I can't find it. Where's it at? Oh, there it is. Well, every time we do that, that just it just takes away from it. And I, I would just tell guys that I would avoid it personally. Um, I know that there's people that do different kinds of hunting, and you know, I mean, hey, look, if you're a if you're a walker, and you're going to use a a, a a monopod that's got an ability to mount your glasses on there, I'm not telling you never to do it. I'm not telling you, you can't do it from. You know, you know, walking along a ridge or whatever. I'm just saying, it, it it just inevitably causes the same problems. Your glasses moving a lot. Your eyes are having you focus, unfocus, and it's just going to cause more eye strain than what it's worth. So, that's what I say. Yeah, and and after I've calmed down a little bit, I would say I'd rather have a, a guy have a monopod and or have his walking sticks and have them in a you know, an X formation and be able to put his binos and glass off of that than not having anything at all. So anything yeah. you can do to stabilize, I just got this question thinking that he's talking about rather than a tripod. Um, yeah, but, I, I, yeah, I mean, I would rather you stabilize the binos on something rather than nothing. Well, uh, next question, and I'm not, Rick, oh, let's, let's, yeah. keep, let's move on. Rick C. I want to get you fired up. Where is a spot in the McDowell Mountains I can practice glassing? Well, to answer that question, I mean, you can go to the Gateway Trail uh, there in sure. North Scottsdale. Uh, you can go to, you know, the Tom's Thumb Trail on the, the other side. I mean, virtually anywhere, uh, you know, you're not going to see a ton of game. There is, you know, javelina. There is some mule deer in there. Um, but, you know, if you want to get out and just kind of get used to hiking up to a knob and, you know, kind of l looking at the lay of the land, I mean, yeah. if anything, you can... You can sit there and What's watch the, the bikini hatch on the trail um, yeah. and, and practice <laughs> looking through your spot or your uh, tripod and getting the tripod set. Uh, yep. But, you know, there, I think there's a lot of areas close to Phoenix, you know, with a 30 to 45 to an hour drive that you could probably end up seeing a lot more game, you know, up up the Beeline Highway, pick your spot, just drive up there 30, 40 yep. minutes, you know, halfway between Payson, and you've got a lot better opportunities if you're trying to actually glass up game. Uh, if you're in the Tucson area, any of those mountain chains around, the Catalinas, uh, the Rencons, well, the Santa Ritas, you know, an hour drive from Tucson, you can be looking at, at actual deer and practicing your glassing. Yeah, and I think when those guys get out and do that, they'll kind of be amazed at what is actually moving out there. Yeah. I can't pronounce the name, so we'll just thoughts on writing 
or Vortex as far as the rifle scopes goes, and this is 10G THT, I think is how you say his name. Um, yeah, you know, I have a, a, a fairly limited a, a amount of exposure to writing. Um, I, you know, the, a couple pieces that I saw um, were nice pieces, and, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, that I was looking at them from a basis of putting um, a, a piece on my, uh, my AR, uh, so I don't want to say that I'm a writing expert. I, you know, I know that they're, you know, they've been up and coming and, um, you know, they're, they're trying to do the right thing. I, I, I just don't have enough experience to just to tell you about their full lineup. Um, and if I had to choose between the two, I, I'd go Vortex because I'm way more familiar and I am on board, you know, with their entire product line. So, um, yeah, that's, I, you yeah, know, that's what I'd say. Uh, Jake Bolar, uh, Jake asks, new Vortex UHD 1050s compared to Swaro EL 1050s. i got to think about this for a minute because I don't believe they have a UHD 1050. They have a, uh, an 842, a 1042, a 1250, and a, uh, and an 1856. So, um, Oh, Jake was trying you, to fool you. He was, it was a... Maybe the test Cody question. Yeah, there's. I mean, I've only. Yeah, I mean, unless somebody's coming out with something that I haven't seen yet, but um, yeah, there's only four, and it's the ten to forty two. So if I was, you know, if I was comparing ten forty two, you know, versus the other, the one thing that that, and, and first of all, um, and I'm going to be full disclosure, I have yet to have the ten forty twos. Um, well, actually, that's not true. I I didn't get to field test them like I wanted to. Um, I got to look through them briefly. Um, I was not in the field under, you know, kind of quote-unquote glassing conditions. Um, I was very impressed with their, their clarity. I was very impressed with their edge-to-edge. -edge. Um, it's a different feeling than, than the ELs because you have a, a field flattener in the way it, it's just a different look. So, you know, I, again, I would tell you to put your, put your eyes behind them uh, test them out the best you can, and and buy the one that's mostly appropriate for you and your budgetary, you know, uh, concern you know, confines. Question here from Blake uh, Mesa. He says best magnification bino for AZ. Uh, my answer would be a ten by forty two is just the standard. That's just the go to. Everyone sure. should have a ten by forty two. Uh, or a 1050. Cody likes the 1050 a little bit, uh, a little bit. The exit pupils a little bit better. Gathers just yep. a smidge more light. Um, you know, if you're hunting coos deer, I think 15 by 56 are an absolute must for a coos deer hunter. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, personally, Jay. I mean, if I was going to build a system, 10 to 42s, 1556, and a good spotting scope. I mean. If I just had to pick, you know, three pieces of gear that I think are really, really important, 10 to 42s, 1556s, and a good spotting scope. Okay, next question from M Hand 775 95 Swirl versus 95 Zeiss Harpia. I've heard the Harpia is better in higher magnification. Um, real, simply put, uh, I got to field test them side by side. Um, you know, I've looked through them before. I really got to sit down and study with them. Um, again, we were looking from anywhere from, you know, like 600 yards to 11. Um, you know, now that I've had time to digest it and, and really think about it, um, flat out, not going to lie, the, uh, the Zeiss is absolutely an awesome piece of gear. Did I find either one of them less or I mean, I look. You're dealing with one at, at 23 power and one at 30 power. So, you know, when you start dialing them up and dialing them down, um, you know, I found you know both of them at the highest, you know, the max power, which is 70. Looking at the same tree, looking at the same thing, um, the one noticeable thing about the Zeiss that's different than the Swarovski is, is you you get a, a, a little bit wider field of view than you do with the Swarovski. And for anybody that doesn't know, it's, it's how they 
it's where they place the, the, the glass within the tube, and it, it allowed them to, if you will, the higher the power you go, where in most spotting scopes it starts to diminish pretty quick, they were, they, they, the way that they did it, they allowed it so that as you turn the power up, that cone or doesn't become as narrow as quick. So um, I think there's a lot out there where guys are talking about, you know, the, oh, it's brighter, it's this, it's that. And I, 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 there's, there's so much that goes into this. Number one, um, you've got two different color spectrums. So are we talking about, you know, like color? Are we talking about clarity and resolution? Um, I mean, what, what are we really talking about? Um, you know, you, you have to focus them. You have, I mean, there's a lot of things that go on with that. So, I, I, again, I can tell you that when I was studying, you know, this grouping of trees and you're, you're trying to literally figure out the knot in the trees and the, the hanging bark and, you know, everything that you're doing and the shadows and differentiating between, you know, one rock or this rock or this squirrel and that, you know, you know squirrel or whatever, uh, I, I can honestly tell you that you're talking about literally two of the best pieces of glass in the world. And I think it's, um, I mean, for me, my opinion, I, I really like the eyepiece of the, uh, of the Swarovski. Um, I, I, I found the, the, the Zeiss eyepiece to be, you know, pleasant. I, 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 I it just was, uh, it, it's better than the old, you know, pieces. Um, for sure, I like that eyepiece way better than I like the, the older style uh, dialites. I mean, without any doubt, you know, or the dioscopes. So, you know, I, I think, again, um, the one thing that the Swarovski has that, you know, the Zeiss doesn't is the, is the, the, compa or the, uh, the, the modularity. So, again, I, I think you've got to look at the, the two of them Put your when eyes you talk behind about them. the modularity. He means you can put a 65, an 85, or a 95 objective on the same eyepiece where the Zeiss you can't. Yeah. And when he's guys, now, when he's talking about modularity, he's the, talking about the ability to switch different objectives. The and the other thing that needs to be said, Jay, right now in the Harpia line with Zeiss, there is no straights. In the Gavia and the Harpia, you know, the, the 85 and, and the 95, there, there is no straight body. So, um, you, can, you know, when you're comparing those two, if you want a straight out of the Zeiss, it's not available. I, I don't know what their plans are, um, but I can tell you that as of right now, I don't know of any plans to have a, a straight um, Zeiss. Um, Next question, Uncle Fred underscore 60, straight or angled spotter? I didn't make that up. We get this question on every single Q&A. Uh, my yep. answer is straight. Uh, most companies sell more angled than straight. Uh, I would argue that the target acquisition with straight is better. I would argue that you don't have to move the center post of your tripod, which makes you have to move your yep. sitting location. is better on a straight. I would say the only place that I would think that I could get used to using an angled spotter is if I was down at you know, say sea level and looking upwards all the time. Possibly, maybe I would want an angled spotter. Uh, and I will argue my my perspective with anybody always. I always go straight. I'm never liking an angled spotter. That's my opinion. Yeah. You may have a different opinion, uh, but I get we get this question every time, and it's like, you know, maybe this person doesn't listen to the podcast, but I think we've literally answered it every single Q&A we've done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And Jay, I couldn't agree more with you. I, I would just... The thing that's so mind-boggling to me, Cody, though, is all of the companies, they all tell me they sell more angle than straight, and I just scratch yeah. my head. I, I literally just scratch my head and go, I, I, either that's misinformation from people that they're not explaining why straight is better. I... I I cannot see how an angle is better than straight. I can't. I can't get over the fact that when they tell me it's 60-40 sales, angle to straight, I just shake my head. Yeah. Uh, all I can say is, is that, yes, there's, 
there's the only moments that I've ever liked and angled was when you're on a flat as a pancake desert floor and you're looking straight up. You keep your tripod low. You can kind of look, you know, you're looking, you know, down into your, into your, uh, your, your angled. And, and yes, am I going to tell you that that's a pretty comfortable look? My problem with it is, is that I normally spend most of my time with my binoculars on the tripod, 85% of my time. And when I find something that I want to look at, I lock the tripod up or the head, I slide my binos out, and I slide the straight in, and I'm looking at the same field of view that I was looking at through my, my binoculars, but a little tighter. And it, it just, it, it helps me find game that, you know, maybe that game is moving off, and you only got a certain amount of time before he's over a ridge. I, I can't tell you how many times we've, you know, had to put, you know, big glass on, on the deer like that and make a decision, okay, do we wait for that buck to come back or do we go get him or what, you know, what are we doing? And flat out, bottom line, I'll take straight every time. Next question, buck, sheep, underscore, as a guide, if I had four to 5000 to spend on glass starting from scratch, what should I get? My opinion is you should get a pair of 10 by 42 EL, Swarovski EL binoculars, and you should get a uh, probably an 85 or a 95 STX uh, modular spotting scope, and you're probably going to be pushing that 5,000 range. But if you're a guide, you owe it to your clients to have absolutely the best uh, two pieces of glass that you yep. can have, and that's my opinion. Yeah, if I, and I don't, I, I'm not going to stray much farther than that. I, I think if a guy buys the best glass he can afford, you know, he's got a good tripod. And, and, you know, he has that ability to, to use the tens and, and a really good spotting scope. If, if he's a guy that's worth his salt, he will pay for that so fast, and it's a business expense. Just get the best you can get and, and, and learn to use it. If you're a guy, don't let your client show up with better binoculars and optics than you have. There's no excuse for that. Okay, Chase Kimber, number six, mule deer hunting. How long will you glass an area before moving on to the next? Well, that Oof. depends. Are, That's a loaded are you looking question. At, are you looking for a particular buck? If you know a buck yep. lives in a certain spot, then you need to stay until you find the buck. It's not like, oh, he's not here, let's move on. Um, how long will you glass before moving on to the next? I feel like if I'm just freelancing and I'm looking a good solid morning from sunup for probably four or five hours uh, up on a high point glassing into a basin, I'm going to get a pretty good feeling of what's there. And in four or yep. five hours, I'm, I'm going to be able to tell you if, if, you know, if I'm just totally freelancing and up, uh, up on a ridge, I'm going to glass for an hour in a basin. I'm going to move into the next basin. I'm going to glass for an hour. I'm going to move into the next base, and I'm going to glass for an hour, and I'm going to try and capitalize on those three, two to three good hours of glassing, figuring that mule deer are pretty easy to see, and if I have a good vantage point that, you know, I'm going to give it a good while, but I'm going to keep moving. Once I find and know that a buck's in a drainage, it's not a matter of, like, moving and, you know, did he go into the next basin? No, he's in the same basin. Just stay there till you find him. I think too many yeah. people move too quickly. I, I uh, and, 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 and missing stuff. I, and I agree with you, Jay. I think that you know, it, are you going to stay and play or load and go? And I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that if you know something's there and and you know what what is you know historically there, you know there may be places that we sit from sun up to sundown. But there's other places that if you're certainly new or not as familiar with it, um, to me it's all about angles. It's all about finding the best place to glass from. Um, you know, if you're going to move, move, move quick, get over there, do it and get set up and get, you know, locked in and, and, you know, put your time in and, and use that angle to your advantage. Um, I think you, you know, um, but I, you know, I, I think sometimes when a guy says, oh, well, I glassed all day and, you know, I, I, I moved 14 miles. I, 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 I don't know. I, I think there's probably some more efficient ways to 
to see a lot of deer. I mean, I'm not saying that guy's doing it wrong. I'm just, I just sometimes think guys, you know, really overwalk and, and they maybe need to sit down and glass a bunch. Next question comes from Jay Butch. Thoughts on SIG BDX system? I'll be using it the first time this fall. I'm pretty excited about the simplicity for this archery hunter. Um, you know, to, to be perfectly honest with you, I, I've I've admired the 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 SIG optics, you know, for a while. Um, I think that their range finders, um, and their their kilo uh, system that that Bluetooth with your phone and um, I, I, I have a lot of respect for it because I think it's a really good unit. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm assuming he's talking about the system that, that also, you know, like coincides with the scope. And I, I, I would tell you, yeah, I mean, I just don't, I, I don't have any personal experience with it, but everything I, I've heard about it, I, you know, it's, I mean, it's supposed to be a, a good system. I mean, and they're, and again, their range finders, I just don't know anything, you know, too bad. I've never heard anything really like, oh, my God, the rangefinders do this, and I don't like that. You just don't – guys just don't complain about their rangefinders. So I would tell you, if you got a system that works for you and, and you can hit what you're aiming at, go for it. Cody, I want to thank you for spending your time with us and uh, commend you on – every single day I get a message from a – listener of my podcast or follower on Instagram of how you've helped them uh, in the optics department with anything with glassing, whether it be answering their glassing questions to helping them find the best gear for them. So I want to thank you for doing that. Um, and I want to just thank you for spending the time with us here on the Q&A and sure. the questions. And guys, I just want to tell you that Cody and I are trying to give you the most honest answers that we can. Uh, sometimes, you know, when I get fired up, it's because I get the question over and over and over, and I think, golly, I've tried to answer this a million times. I must not be getting through to people, and sometimes I end up getting frustrated and, and fired up, but I'm, I'm easily fired up anyway. Uh, but we're trying to give you the best information we can, and we're trying to uh, you know, help everybody out there, educate everybody, inform everybody, and help them be able to make the best decisions they can. Uh, and then, you know, Cody, it's just uh, great for you to be able to spend time with us here. I uh, want to give you a chance to let the listeners know um, how they can reach out again and yeah. if you have um, any last-minute words for the guys. Well, you know, there's a couple things. First of all, Jay, thanks for giving me the platform and, and allowing us to, to be a part of this. Um, I can't tell you how, um, you know, beneficial it is to, to uh, get questions and answers out and people call back and they, they want to expand on stuff and say, hey, can you explain this further? And so I just, I, I think it's a, just an awesome way to get, you know, the word out, um, number one. Number two, um, you know, there's, uh, guys, go check out the, the sale that's going on at GoHunt.com. Um, there's a whole bunch of different stuff on sale throughout the, uh, the the gear shop. Look at the optics. You know, um, look at all of it. Um, the uh, and by the way, there is a Zeiss uh, promotion going on that I strongly su suggest you go look at um, with the Harpias, the Gavias, and the uh, and the RFs. I, I strongly recommend you, you looking at that because there's some really good savings there. <laughs> but uh, as far as getting a hold of me, um, you can always call seven zero two. 847-8747, extension number two. Um, and you can also uh, reach out to uh, uh, optics at gohunt.com or um, you can go to our YouTube page and subscribe there and, or subscribe to the YouTube page and then um, you can ask us questions on the videos. And guys, you know, I, I travel up there, you know, uh, once a month or twice a month and and I'm always doing videos, and we're always trying to put new content out for you and try to answer questions like we're doing now, but only put them, you know, kind of, you know, behind the glass, so to speak, or with the glass. And uh, so, again, Jay, I just appreciate the platform to, to let uh, people hear, you know, kind of my passion and my love, you know, for, for glassing and, and finding game. Right on, buddy. Sounds good. Well, it, uh, season's upon us, and I uh, look forward to uh... – you know, seeing some success stories coming out of Arizona. Looks like they're killing some really big deer and, and elk season's, you know, a couple weeks away. So 
just kicking yeah. off all over the West here, and everybody's excited. So, uh, guys, if you're looking for optics, if you've got any glassing questions, uh, give Cody a call. Make sure to enter into the drawing uh, for the $1,000 Go Hunt Gear Shop giveaway. Uh, and, Cody, thanks again. Uh, we'll catch you later down the road, okay? You got it, bud. I appreciate it very much, and uh, we'll talk all to right. you soon. God bless. Take care.